Today's reading is taken from James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that, and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what, by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deed is dead. This is the word of the Lord. When I was growing up, the treat I loved to spend my pocket money on when we went to the seaside was a stick of rock. As an adult, I now understand the concern of my parents at the time of what it would do to my teeth. It's basically a stick of sugar with food colouring. But for a child, it's mesmerising. Because, of course, of the way it says the name of where you bought it right through the middle. So you bite off a bit and you have a look and you bite off another bit and you have another look and it's the same all the way through. Is that your faith and my faith? Are we like that? Are we the same all the way through if someone cut into us? Is that how it is in our lives so that it affects everything we think and say and do and feel? That's the question James is going to ask us today. He's been writing in this letter of um, the danger of self-deception, the danger of becoming double-minded as Christians of talking the talk but not walking the walk. And our bit uh, today, second half of chapter 2, begins in verse 14 with the question, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? That's what's at stake here in our lives. Christianity is not some sort of philosophy to make life a little bit better now. It's about being saved from eternal punishment for eternal life, which starts now, a relationship with God that goes on forever. That's the context here. It's what's just been talked about before our bit in verse 13. It's a warning of judgment, the day that God will bring justice for all human sin and wrongdoing, but also the day of his mercy for those who fled to him for mercy. James is writing then to people who know about these things, to people who have some kind of faith. They believe in God, they go to church. Um, nowadays, they always wear a cross. They put Christian or Church of England on the form whenever it asked. They do believe Christian stuff. They have some kind of faith. But James is really concerned. Is it saving faith? Can you imagine that? Going through the whole of your life, calling yourself a Christian, but finding at the end of it all, it does no good and brings no salvation. So James is writing to warn. He's warning against a theoretical faith. A faith that's good in theory, but in practice, which doesn't actually carry through. And instead, he's going to give us two amazingly inspiring examples of an all-the-way-through faith. Because that's what saving faith looks like. Uh, verse 15, let's start with his warning about theoretical faith. And 
He starts there, he says, let's suppose. Suppose there's someone you know through the church who is in genuine need. They've had no work since the start of lockdown. And now they've got to the point that actually they're struggling to pay for electricity or to buy food for their family. You, on the other hand, have money to spare because you've been saving up for a holiday that may or may not happen this year. And you say to the struggling person, I'm so sorry to hear about what's happening to you. I really hope that it all works out. I'll pray for you, but you don't do anything to help them. Verse 16, you see the question there? What good is it? What good are warm words when action is needed? And what stopped the, uh, the uh, person taking action in that just suppose? Well, most probably, if we're reading James, it could well be this double-mindedness issue. On the one hand, that person believes in Jesus. On the other, well, don't I need to look after number one? If loving my neighbour means sacrificing my holiday, well, goodness, count me out. Cut into that kind of Christian down the middle, and what will you find? Well, will it be like a stick of rock all the way through? No, it won't. It'll be patchy. There'll be some bits, and if you look there, you'll see a faith-driven life, and there'll be other bits. If you look there, you'll find worldly thinking. They're inconsistent. They're not all the way through. What would we call that? Perhaps we call that nominal Christianity. But James is not so British about it. Verse 17, he calls it dead faith. And verse 19, he compares it to demon faith. Because the demons all believe that God is one. There are no atheists in hell and their theology is impeccable. The demons know it all, but are totally unchanged by what they know. And some people respond to the word of God like that. They have a, a theoretical faith. And James has given a picture of it in chapter 1 and verse 23. He says, it's like seeing your reflection in a mirror and then straight away forgetting what you look like. Or walking past a shop and seeing that you've got chocolate around your mouth and yogurt on your nose because you've seen your reflection. And then carrying on walking and doing nothing at all about it. That's what it's like to hear God's word, but to carry on unchanged. James also gives a, a positive picture in chapter 1. He talks about God giving us birth through his word of truth. And pictures the good news about Jesus as, as like a seed planted in, a, in, a, in the ground or an embryo embedded in the womb. And he urges his hearers, chapter 1, verse 21, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. That's where saving faith comes from. From humbly accepting what God says. Putting our faith in him, listening to him, responding in all of our lives. In other words, it's... It's faith in the word of God becoming our call, saying where we're from in a way that will then transform all of life and our actions too. Which means that saving faith is, is not saying here, the message is not here that you've got to add certain deeds to what you already believe and do certain good works and then that's the sort of thing that James is telling people about. It's not sort of adding something, it's outworking something, it's living it, it's, it's, it's having it all the way through our lives so that it shows itself in our actions and transforms us. And then he gives us two real life examples of that to help us to absorb that point. The first is Abraham, this uh, man we read about right at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 12. God makes him astonishing promises. He's going to have offspring. He's going to have a land. He's going to have blessing. And he's going to be a blessing to all peoples on earth. 
And then three chapters later and ten years later, God expands the promise about the son, about the offspring. He, he invites Abraham, he says, look, look up at the light sky, uh, count the stars if you can. And then God promises him, so shall your offspring be. And like James chapter 2 verse 23, 23 says, Abraham believed that extravagant promise from God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. God says, well, that's all I was looking for. God was able to see Abraham and see that Abraham took God at his word. And God says, you're now right with me. That's all he was looking for for Abraham. It's all he'll look for for you and for me. Is will we believe his gospel promise to us? Will we be those who, when we hear his word, it's implanted in our lives. We believe and live in accordance with what God says. If we do that, it will become in our lives an all the way through faith. And we see that in the extraordinary test that God then gave Abraham that uh, James 2 tells us about. That after Isaac was born, God called Abraham to take his son his one and only son, whom he loved, and to sacrifice him on a mountain that God would show him. What a test of Abraham's faith. And as Abraham trundled up that hill with his son carrying the instant bonfire kit, a box of matches in his pocket and a machete in his hand, there's no question whether Abraham's faith was real, is there? Whether he had the kind of faith that says, rather than just a theoretical faith. Because if you look at him doing that, if you look at Isaac tied up on the altar, and Abraham with his knife raised, it is proof that he was trusting that God would do whatever God said he would do, even if that meant... He would have to raise Isaac from the dead. He states, Abraham staked his whole life on it, his son's life on it. And in fact, the future of the world, salvation on it, because God had promised it would be all through Isaac. And as he raised the knife, he put the, his money where his mouth is, his whole life where his faith is. And uh, Abraham's life, uh, Abraham's faith in that moment was lived out. And in the words of verse 22, it was completed by what he did. It was all the way through. You, you saw it in action because it was the whole of his life. And what did God do? He gloriously provided uh, a substitute for Isaac. It was always his plan. Uh, Abraham was, uh, God spoke to Abraham directly and diverted him to uh, see a ram caught in a thicket. He provided a substitute to die instead, just like he did for you and for me with Jesus, his one and only son, who died in our place and whom he raised from the dead. Now, those are unique circumstances, I'm hastening to add. But faith, our faith, your faith, will be tested in life. Perhaps it'll be the challenge of staying single because you've never, never met a Christian who you can imagine and feel that you would want to be married to. Perhaps it's uh, the challenge of living in a smaller flat than you could otherwise afford or going on less expensive holidays because you're giving generously to God's work and to uh, good causes elsewhere to his church. Or maybe it is because you're, you're saying no to promotion so that you have time with your family and so that you have time for Christian service rather than all the hours God sends being work hours. Or perhaps it's just as an older person enduring the physical discomfort, the, the effort it takes to be active in serving the Lord as part of his people rather than just opting for a life of comfort and ease. Whatever it is for you or for me, the call for us all is to have faith in God's word at the core of our lives, implanted there, so that it goes all the way through our thoughts, our words, our attitudes, our actions, everything. 
There's one more example that James gives us another positive story uh, in verse 25 from ancient Jericho. Two spies were sent out by the Israelites to do a recce of the land and of the city. And they end up in Jericho's red light district. There they meet Rahab. Rahab has heard all about the God of Israel. She's heard all about what the God of Israel has promised to his people. And she knows his reputation. And she believes it. And says to the spies... I want to be in with you. She receives God's word and so she receives the spies. And when the Jericho Gestapo come looking for them, she has a cover story at the ready. Verse 25, she too is counted righteous by God for her all the way through faith that you see there. Because it's faith that produces action because it's all the way through her life. The interrogation for Rahab must have been terrifying. As those uh, police or, or Gestapo, I've called them, as they grilled her, where are they? They were seen in your house. Where are they now? And she sends them off in the wrong direction so that the spies can get away. She was making a completely new start. She was cutting all her ties with what was familiar. She was putting all of her eggs in the God basket. But as she said to those spies, I know that the Lord has given you the land. God had said so. And for Rahab, that was enough. It may feel sometimes for you and for me, as it must have done in terms of her feelings for Rahab, it, it must have felt risky to trust God when no one else was. But actually, it was the only safe option. Jericho came crashing down. Rahab was saved. Let's end with a moment or two to examine ourselves. We've thought then about the two different ways that our faith might go in our lives. We're thinking in James about this issue of double-mindedness, talking the talk but not walking the walk. Are there ways that we might be drifting into that? Believing in theory what God says, but not living in line with it in practice. Let me give you some examples, perhaps. It's um, just a lack of mercy being shown in our lives, a lack of love for neighbour. Could it be that for you or for me? Could it be a, a worldliness in our thinking or our living, our decision making, our actions, that we're just the same as everyone else, that we're allowing ourselves to be corrupted by the world? Or could it be just... Thinking only about number one and refusing to take any risks for God. A theoretical faith, says James, he warns us, it's a dead faith. It's a faith like the demons have, but one that makes no difference to our lives in practice. Saving faith is this all the way through faith. So how will we see that in our lives in greater and greater measure? How will we see this all the way through faith, which affects everything in our lives? Other parts of the Bible will tell us to pray. Pray for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. We want to do that. But this part of the Bible adds something. It, it, it urges us that, that we're going to be those, it wants us to be those who really listen to what God says. It urges us to be those people, not just to be theory people, but and so to deceive ourselves, but to do what God says, to be those who repent as well as believe. In other words, to for God's word to be implanted in our core, so that whatever he says, this gospel about Jesus was be and become our core all the way through our lives. Faith that God loves us. 
Faith that Jesus came for you and for me, that he died to pay for all our sins. Faith that he raises us to be God's children. That's our identity now. He's made us righteous. We belong to him. Faith that his word for life is the best way to live. Love for the Lord our God. Love for our neighbour as ourselves. Wholeheartedness. Passing on mercy to others. Loving them as God loves us. That's what saving faith looks like. Implanted in our lives as we listen to God's word. As we put it into practice. It's faith in action all the way through. And it's a life which is an adventure with God.